타라오 박사님을 소개해 올립니다. 타라오 박사님은 동아시아 연구센터의 대표고 어, 관심사는 한국의 경제, 정치 경제 시스템, 또 한반도 비상 사태와 통일, 아시아에서의 미국의 동맹 관계, 북한의 인권 등. 예, 이릅니다. 그런 주제에 대해서 관심을 갖고 계시고요. 공군에서 복무를 하셨습니다. 공군 베테랑이신 타로 박사는 미국 국방부 등에서 국가 안보, 정보, 또 동맹, 정치 군사 문제를 연구했습니다. 타로 박사님은 데이비스 캘리포니아 대학교에서 국제 관계학 학사 학위를 땄고. 프린스턴 대학교에서는 국제정책학 석사, 오스틴 텍사스 대학교에서는 공공, 공공정책학 박사 학위를 받았습니다. 오늘은 한국의 부정선거와 그 대처 방안이라는 제목으로 발표를 해 주시겠습니다. 타라오 박사님께 마이크를 넘기겠습니다. 네, 이렇게 동영상을 만나게 돼서 반가워요. 아... 제가 아, 이 여러분들 앞에서 이렇게 말씀을 드리는 것에 대해서 아주 영광으로 생각하고요. 어, 또 저를 초대해 주신 k c p e 에 아주 감사를 드립니다. 음, 아니, 요즘 아주 힘드시죠? 우선 내가 어떻게 시작하고 싶냐면 힘내세요 <웃음> 하고 싶어요. 어, 그리고 제가 영어로 해야지 좀더 정확하게 말을 하니까 이제부터는 영어로 할게요. Uh, as some of you know, I've written about the election fraud in South Korea. Let me just state why this is such an important topic. And I'm going to start out with the very identity of the Republic of Korea. The Republic of Korea is a liberal democracy, and it is also a republic. In a liberal democracy and a republic, the citizens have the sovereignty. And the citizens temporarily lend their sovereignty to their elected representatives. And they do this through the election process, through the voting process. So what this means is that the election process has to be transparent and has to be trustworthy in order for the outcome to reflect people's will. If the voters have doubts about the process and if they don't trust the outcome, then the steps need to be taken to restore that trust. Because if the um, outcome does not reflect the voters' will, then it's not a representative government. In South Korea's general election on April 15, 2020, the official outcome was 180 seats. For the Dobro Minju Party, or uh, also known as the Democratic Party of Korea, and its satellite party. This is shocking. Uh, Gordon mentioned this earlier 180 out of 300, that's 60%, which means that they can pretty much pass any, almost any laws, except the Constitution, any laws at once without the opposition input. So that is very dangerous. So let's look at why people are saying. That fraudulent elections occurred. Let me begin with Professor Walter Mabane's study, and I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, he has this statistical analysis of the election data using his e forensics model. And this model has been used for, well, he has used it for a lot of different um, elections around the world. And what his model showed in the case of South Korea is that over 1.4 million votes were fraudulent. That's, that's quite a bit. Of those, one over one, a uh, slate over 1 million votes were manufactured and, and about 360,000 votes were stolen from other candidates. So that's all pretty significant. His model also revealed that in certain districts, the fraudulent winning party was the Democratic Party. But in other districts, the fraudulent winning party was the United Future Party. So this issue is not about left or right, but it's an issue for all citizens of South Korea. 
Um, this fits right into the discovery that there were more votes casted than the number of registered voters in Korea. And this alone should be enough evidence to basically throw out the elections and require a new election right away. But of course, that didn't happen. There was a recount in one district um, out of all the districts in South Korea. And that's only because there was a, um, not a, but the, some of the citizens that were monitoring at the polling booth, they were very, very vigilant and they questioned the outcome. It just wasn't right. So they basically uh, reset the machine. They restarted the machine, uh, the vote counting machine, and they proceeded to recount. And the second time around, the results were dramatically different. So this is how it was. Uh, initially, the Democratic Party had 180 seats and the United Future Party had 80 votes. So huge difference. Um, but then after the reset, it was actually reversed. It was United Future Party that had more votes, um, 170, and the Democratic Party had 159. So that actually reversed the situation. But even the totals were different. Initially, um, the total was 260. But later on, the second time around, it was 329. So, I mean, what does this mean? How could this happen? Well, um, let me draw your attention to this other video that has been out there showing a vote counting machine system uh, at polling stations. And you may have seen this, but they're taking this uh, state, um, machine out. And on the back of it, there are four USB ports. And there was a USB mouse or there was a mouse plugged into the USB. These two USB ports are serious, serious security concerns. Um, any, anyone can uh, plug in some sort of hacking devices in this USB uh, ports and that can soon take over the computers in a matter of seconds. These hacking devices can look very innocuous like a mouse or a uh, a, a thumb drive or a phone cable, a keyboard. So it is very possible for this to happen. That brings to the next question. Did the voting machine have communications capability? And according to the National Election Commission, there is not supposed to be any sort of communications capability. But um, if you saw, again, going back to the video, the machine, it's, a, it's actually a system. It's a vote counting machine. And then there are two, what looks like a uh, consumer laptop and, and uh, a printer. So these two consumer laptops, if, if that's what they are, then they have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capability. So it has ability to communicate. So the problem of electronic boat rigging is that it's not easily observable to human eyes. Um, often it's not observable at all. So transparency is critical when using electronic means. The, the National Election Commission should release source code and that'll help with this transparency issue. And I'll talk about that more later. Uh, later. If the machines weren't enough of a problem, the election network used Huawei equipment. And I know this has been brought up several times the, the National Election Commission chose LG U plus 5G for its Wi-Fi network. The problem is that LG U plus uses Huawei equipment in its 5G network. And it doesn't have to be equipment at the polling station because it's, it's uh, wherever the network is. It could be at the base station. It could be at the data centers. So that's where the Huawei equipment is. And if it goes through that, then um, then it brings this other problem of Chinese Communist Party accessing and manipulating the data and the network and using them for nefarious purposes. And Gordon Chang mentioned this earlier. So this opens door for CCP interference in South Korean elections. Additionally, there were Chinese people actually working at this polling booth, which is just uh, incredulous. We all know, um, and other speakers have mentioned this, China has been trying to exert influence over politics and politicians 
all around the world, the United States, Australia, Canada, European countries. Uh, in Taiwan, the CCP attempted to influence the elections there too, but it backfired over there, fortunately. China's intention to influence other countries, clear. So why would CCP exempt South Korea from its influence operations? The intentions there and the capabilities there. What steps has the NEC, the National Election Commission, taken to address the cyber vulnerabilities and concerns? None. The organization which is supposed to ensure that the election process is transparent and secure and trustworthy hasn't taken steps to even identify the problems. So that in itself is very, very problematic. Continuing on, there's also evidence of unmarked ballots that were ran through this vote counting machine and counted towards uh, the ruling party because it was a slot number one. These blank votes should have been discarded. They should have been just thrown away, but they were counted. And when Professor uh, Mubain mentioned these um, manufacturer votes, well, that's what these are, is blank votes. Despite the, the voters' request to install CC camera to prevent tampering, the NEC didn't install any. They refused to do so. And why would why would NEC deny measures that would enhance security and legitimacy? Let me point out some other anomalies. Pre-vote ballots were stored, stored in duffel bags inside a gym. I mean, that's ridiculous. Gym is where you go work out. That's not where you store your ballots. Uh, as far as some of the early votes and mail-in vote ballots, they were transported in open plastic baskets. This is really um, uh, troublesome. They should be transported in a locked, sealed containers, not, not in baskets. And some of the ballots, a, a speaker mentioned this earlier, but the ballots had uneven margins. And that means the NEC did not take measures to make this um, counterfeit proof. What's interesting beyond these, and there's a long list, you know, list all because of the time, but the behavior of the courts and the prosecutors are also very, very odd. Um, in fact, they're really not taking any steps on over 100 election uh, fraud cases that are filed. And what's interesting is that they also deny the preservation of electronic evidence. That is the key. Yet they did not allow the preservation of those. So what should be done? Uh, in my writing, I talked about Bolivian case. And in Bolivia, the international inspection team went there only after 10 days, 10 days after the election. In South Korea, it has been several months already and nothing has been done. What should have occurred right away is revalidation and recount of the votes. But in South Korea's case, with over a million fraudulent votes, the results really should be nullified. After the nullification and after measures are taken to improve the election process, there should be a new election. And from what I understand, if a new election is to occur, it is a year after, so it'll be April next year. During the new election, because there's so, so many problems with the electronic voting machine, vote counting machine, what should really happen is um, they really should be hand counted, doing it manually, just like Taiwan did. In January, in the early part of this year, Taiwan had an election, and this is how they counted their votes. They had one person who um, took the ballot, read it, and passed it on to the second person. And the second person then read it, and he held it up high for the audience, everyone out there to see uh, who, who people voted for. And this was then passed on to a third person who also verified it, who looked at it, verified it, 
and stacked it. And then there was somebody in the background who was telling everything on the whiteboard. And all of this, all of this was uh, videotaped and placed on YouTube. That's transparency. And South Korea may need that level of transparency. So, you know, there are other things that can be done. I mentioned uh, earlier about the um, uh, NEC releasing the source code and as well as the schematics and details of the voting machine. That is something else that needs to be done. Um, they also need to remove the USB ports because again, that's serious vulnerability. And of course the investigation needs to occur um, overall, but um, let's just say that it's something we desire and we're still waiting for that to happen. One other thing that I'd like to point out is the behavior of the National Election Commission. It really should change its culture. I know that Representative, former Representative Min, he was one of the victims of this. Um, the NEC really should change its culture from secrecy to transparency. It needs to change its culture from disrespecting the citizens and treating them like criminals to one that is accountable to citizens, the one that works for the citizens. Free and fair elections is one of the pillars of liberal democracy. So it's important to restore this lost trust in the election process and the system if South Korea is to remain a liberal democracy. Thank you.